This is the first lecture in CET 40400 Property Surveying where we're getting into actual course content. And the title of this particular lecture is Definition, Scope, and Nature of Evidence. And this happens to be coincident with the title of the one of the first chapters in our course text that we're going to be focusing on. So we will be relying heavily on the course text that I outlined in the in the earlier lecture where we went over the syllabus and course policies. And as had been stated then and as we'll be noting with every one of these lectures, there are PDF handout files available for you to, if you choose to, download and print in order to assist you in keeping notes. Most of the lectures we'll go through will have a content slide where we'll summarize what we're going to be covering in in the lecture and what you should have an understanding of when we complete it. So for this lecture, upon completion, you should understand first the surveyor's role in boundary determination. Next we'll go over original surveys and retracement surveys and that should be a review for most of you. We'll look at the definitions of evidence, then we'll talk about the surveyor's role in evidence, describe what is meant by the law of evidence, and then we'll look at sections regarding being impartial, evidence versus proof, the steps for performing a boundary survey, we'll get into evidence, conclusions, and proof, then we'll get into the various kinds of evidence and classifications of evidence, and then focus a little more on the types of evidence that are typically gathered by surveyors. We'll discuss what's meant by burden of proof and preponderance of evidence, as well as being clear and convincing. We'll also describe what's meant by beyond a reasonable doubt. We'll look at the relevancy of materiality, admissibility, relevancy, and conclusiveness of evidence, and then finish up with the duties of surveyors in finding evidence. I'm going to start by looking at the preface section in our text. And this is something we don't always do, but I think there's a message here on this slide and on the next slide that we want to make sure that we get across so that you can understand the direction that this course is going. So let me just read through this and then I'll have some comments at the end. It says that seldom do professors require that students read introductions to their textbooks. Over 50 years ago, one of our college professors patterned his entire final exam on the introduction of the textbook we used in his class. The indignation of the students of, quote, having to read the introduction could be heard across the campus of Syracuse University. Yet, the introduction or preface should set the tone for the book. The technical aspects of surveying are becoming more complex, and colleges and universities are having difficulties finding time in already crowded class schedules to add new courses. As our careers have progressed throughout the years, we, and he's talking here about the authors, have either by necessity or by demand created a special area of surveying that is seldom included in courses of study of these colleges that teach surveying programs, and that is the legal area of surveying. No longer do young surveyors commence at the bottom of the professional ladder and learn by doing. Today the trend is toward college-trained individuals filling the ranks of the professional surveyors, and as such the hands-on experience that has made this book so popular is being denied to the students. The technical aspects of surveying are developing more rapidly than are either the legal aspects or the business aspects of the profession. As each of us becomes older, we are cognizant of the fact that we are not immortal. We ask ourselves this question, who will step into our positions as we stepped in and assume the position that was vacated by the late Kurt Brown. Curtis Brown was the original author of this particular textbook. The answer is we don't know. We hope some young surveyor will come forth and take up the banner of the well-rounded surveyor of tomorrow, one who possesses the love of the law and sees that technology is but a tool of the surveyor and not a god that must be bowed before and adored before the, quote, altar of technology. And I got to say that I agree wholeheartedly with what the authors are trying to stress here. I've been surveying for many years and I studied to take my land surveying exam many years ago actually back in the early 80s and most of what I studied had to do with the legal aspects of surveying and over the last couple of decades technology has taken our 
profession by storm, and it's a good thing. I am an advocate for technology, but where it becomes a problem is when, particularly the, those that are new coming into profession, think that it's all about the technology to the point that they push out the legal aspects. And unfortunately, that's happening in a lot of college programs across the country that still try to maintain good enrollments in quote-unquote surveying programs. And so, you know, you all of a sudden have to have classes on GPS and GIS and photogrammetry and remote sensing and a lot of these things, some of them that we use often, probably every day in surveying, but they're tools. Like they said there in that last paragraph, they're only tools and they're a means for us to get to an end. The decisions that the surveyors typically make are legal in nature. They're based on legal principles and legal aspects and that's what this course is about. So we'll talk a little bit about technology in one of the lectures that we're going to talk about here and where it fits from the standpoints of evidence. But uh, this course, as has been some of the courses that preceded it, that many of you have taken, is, is really focused on what I think is the foundation of what a professional land surveyor is all about, and that's understanding legally what their role is and how to make the decisions that come with the privilege of having a land surveyor's license. Chapter one of the text is entitled Introduction and I'm going to go over some of the items that are included there right at the beginning of the chapter in particular. Relative to the scope of the textbook there's a few points to go through here. First the course text is not a book about quote how to survey. Let's make that in a sense of dealing with measuring techniques it's about survey evidence. We're going to talk about the steps that typically should be taken to do a boundary survey so you might say well that's how to survey but we're not going to be talking about how to make measurements. The text is aimed at those students who wish to enter the surveying profession and at those surveyors who locate boundary lines and land parcels or utilize evidence in searching for and locating the footsteps of the earlier surveyors who originally created the parcels or property. And also the text is aimed at the professional surveyor as a study guide for taking professional land surveyors examinations. The goal is to modernize the surveyor. This is one of the textbooks that I consider as a keeper for somebody who is going through school and has to use it in a, in a course and you're going to use this to study for your exam and it's one of the textbooks along with boundary control and legal principles and Waddle's legal description book and other books that we've had in some of the courses that we've gone through here that I keep on a bookshelf where I practice my my surveying profession and where I actually do surveys because I do refer to them occasionally and it includes information that you're not going to be able to memorize and, and keep right um, available to yourself from a mental standpoint but it certainly is good reference material and um, I know many surveyors who have the same attitude that I have and they keep these textbooks close by. We've discussed the surveyor's role in determining boundaries in one or more of the previous classes that led up to this class and somewhat as a review of that what we're also looking at here and covering in this particular chapter is the surveyor's role in boundary determination and he says here that for simplicity boundary surveying can be divided into two general areas or disciplines number one is locating or relocating described parcels of land and two creating new parcels and as we go along here we're gonna bring back the terminology of original surveys and retracement surveys or original surveyors and retracement surveyors and that's where this is leading up to continuing on this theme here we want to describe the difference between the terms property line and boundary line with particular emphasis on how the authors will be using those terms in this text. I think you would agree that to most the property line and a boundary line are synonymous with each other but they use these differently here. Per the authors of the course text the terms property line or property boundary deal with property rights and are quote legal questions and as such are not addressed by land surveyors surveyors locate boundaries or land boundaries or deed lines they do not and cannot locate property rights so the boundary is the line that's described in the description of the property and we can should be able to lay that on the ground if it's described in a sufficient enough manner the property 
lines or property boundaries are where the people actually own to and that could be greater than or less than what is described by the boundary line. So we'll expand on this more as we go along. Continuing and getting into the surveyor's role in boundary determinations, the text says that in attempting to survey and locate a described parcel of land, the only permanent and correct location of its boundaries is where a court of competent jurisdiction would locate them. To know where the court would locate property boundaries, the surveyor must have expert knowledge and understanding of the laws of boundaries and evidence. Yet regardless of where the surveyor would locate the boundaries of the parcel, the final location of any boundary is nothing more than an opinion of the evidence recovered, evaluated, and then interpreted, and this is always subject to review by the courts and by other subsequent surveyors. So what you're beginning to see here is a tie between the evidence that we as surveyors find and what we eventually call the boundary, which is based on the evidence that we accept. Goes on to say that once a boundary is questioned or litigated and the parties seek termination by a jury, the trial is usually divided into two parts. It is left to the jury to decide what the facts are and it is left to the judge to apply the law to the facts. And then there's a statement in the text that says what boundaries are is a matter of law and where boundaries are is a matter of fact. They go on there to explain that thus in a trial the jury decides where an original monument position was located based on evidence that the surveyor used to formulate an opinion. The judge decides whether the monument or measurement is controlling as a matter of ev evidence presented at the trial and not necessarily as a matter of law. In a survey based on the record, the surveyor may be asked to determine both of these questions, either knowingly or unknowingly. And in the next chapter, we're going to get into laws of evidence necessary to prove facts and the order of importance of discovered evidence. So now we're going to get into original surveys and retracement surveys. And as I stated, this should be a review for most of you, but it's worth going over because we'll be working with these terms throughout the course. I've got two sources of information for this slide which deals with original surveys and the first is boundary control and legal principles which is the text that we used in the survey law course and that happens to have the same authors as the text we're using for this course and the other is from title 865 IAC 1-12 which are the standards of practice for doing boundary surveys in Indiana we typically refer to that rule as rule 12 and to describe an original survey per the boundary control text, it's the, it says that the original survey does not ascertain boundaries, it creates them. And Rule 12 states that an original survey is a survey that is executed for the purpose of locating and describing real property that has not been previously described in documents conveying an interest in said real property. So whenever you're creating a new boundary that has not been yet described in the records and conveyed, you're completing an original survey. Now I've got the definition of a retracement survey from two sources. The first is from the definition of surveying and associated terms from the American Congress on Surveying and Mapping. This is their latest handbook on definition of surveying and associated terms. And the second again is from Rule 12. So from ACSM, it says that a retracement survey is made for the purpose of verifying the direction and length of lines and identifying the monuments and other marks of an established prior survey. And Rule 12 says that a retracement survey is a survey of real property which has been previously described in documents conveying an interest in said real property. So you can see here that in order to have a retracement survey or in order to complete a retracement survey, you have to have had an original survey, and that's what you'll be basing your retracement survey on. Before we leave this slide, I want to point out that the American Congress on Surveying and Mapping, or ACSM, is no longer known by that name. In fact, that organization was dissolved several years ago and is now uh, the National Society of Professional Surveyors. And actually, NSPS was a member organization of ACSM, when ACSM was there, but at the time that this definitions 
handbook, I call it, was, was last published in 2005, ACSM was still in existence. So those of you who might want to get a copy of this, of this handbook, which is a very handy book for you to have, would uh, go to the NSPS website and that's included in your um, external link and uh, reference area of uh, the Blackboard course here and you should be able to find a copy of that that you could purchase if needed. It's a pretty inexpensive publication but very useful. Continuing in our text it says that according to decisions reported in court cases surveyors in retracing old boundary lines are directed and obligated to quote follow the footsteps of the original or creating surveyor and that's a theme that we work with and we'll talk about we've talked about it in past classes and we'll continue to talk about that in this class follow the footsteps of the original or creating surveyor therefore it is essential that any surveyor who practices in the area of property or boundary identification has knowledge of the historical background of land surveys in general and the geographic area specifically and that he or she knows under which laws they were originally performed. So there's a couple of things we can see here that we can kind of expound on. First of all when you start talking about following the footsteps of the original surveyor you're kind of setting up the charge of the original surveyor and of the retracement surveyor the original surveyor needs to leave footsteps to follow and the retracement surveyor is to follow those footsteps that have been left by the original surveyor and sometimes those aren't easy to find particularly on old boundaries the other thing that they talk about here is relative to understanding the historical background of land surveys in general and the geographic area specifically and knowing that he or she, the surveyor, the retracement surveyor, knows under which laws that they were originally performed. So what we're talking about here is having knowledge, not just general knowledge of, of land surveys and of uh, historical knowledge and background of land surveys, but also having some knowledge of the geographic area that you're working with. And I'm sure that if you work with a company that does surveys in varying areas in a state or even in different states, you have found that there's differences in customs and there's differences in the way evidence might be considered and, and how it might be identified in different geographic areas. And of course, understanding the laws that were in place when the original boundaries were established is also going to be very important. Read through the rest of that section and you'll see the equivalence, if you will, of the term footsteps and evidence. And this is something that I lean on heavily not just in my classes but in the seminars that I teach to practicing surveyors for continuing education. So much of what we've learned in developing state standards over the last few decades in different states is how evidence ties into these boundary surveys and how those pieces of evidence need to be clear and portrayed in the work not just on the plat but out in the field. And so it's easy to identify footsteps as being the same um, and synonymous with evidence when you're talking about boundary surveying. The rest of chapter one goes over some very important items I'm not going to cover specifically on the slides here but I'm going to suggest that you read through that and some of these items may be uh, mentioned or called upon in the assignment that's going to follow this lecture and quiz and all. So uh, there's a section on the definitions of surveys and surveyors there's sections on, on the uh, activities of boundary surveyor, the surveyor in society, which is a very important topic for us to consider. The current need for surveyors is another section, and the future needs for surveyors is something that I think we're at a real critical point here with in our profession. And then they get into land data systems and global positioning system, just from the standpoint of introducing the concepts into a textbook that focuses on boundary evidence. So make sure you read over the rest of the chapter. We're going to move forward now into chapter two and here we've got the title of this chapter being the same as the title of this lecture, Definition, Scope, and Nature of Evidence. And on the first page there, going over the historical concept of evidence, it starts to just brush the edges of what evidence is actually all about. But you have to ask yourself a question here at this point is just what is evidence?
not from the standpoint of saying is this evidence of a point on the ground or is this evidence of an original corner or whatever but just in from the sense of the courts and from the sense of past court cases how is evidence described so the chapter starts off with a section on historical concept of evidence and they've got a outline statement there that says that there is no technical or legal substitute for found original evidence and that's where we're going to start with this and work our way through several slides of definitions of evidence and looking to see how those tie into what the surveyor should look for for evidence. I always like to start off with some very general definitions and like to go to just a dictionary or maybe a web source and so I want to start with that here with a couple of examples of basic definitions of evidence and from Webster's Dictionary evidence is described as quote a statement of a witness an object etc bearing on or establishing the point in question in a court of law and if you go to a web source as cited on this slide evidence is described as something that gives a sign or proof of the existence of truth of something or that helps somebody to come to a particular conclusion. As part of understanding this and how difficult evidence might be to define in general terms, our authors go through um, a whole list of different definitions and late in the section 2-1 there they start a paragraph out by saying one will find a distinction between the meaning of the word as used by surveyors and as used by legal scholars in the courts. And regardless of the definition, it can be said that there is no single good or positive definition of evidence. And then to have the student appreciate this problem, they start with a definition that's credited to Bentham. It says that evidence is any matter of fact, the effect, tendency, or design of which is to produce in the mind a persuasion, affirmative or disaffirmative, of the existence of some matter of fact. Then what follows is a list of statements of evidence from Blackstone. It says that evidence signifies that which demonstrates, makes clear, or ascertains the truth of the fact or point in issue either on one side or the other. Next we have what Greenleaf wrote and this says that evidence is legal acceptance and includes all means by which any alleged matter of fact, the truth of of which is being submitted to investigation is established or disproved. And then we have a statement by Thayer that says that evidence is any matter of fact which is furnished to a legal tribunal otherwise by reasoning or a reference to what is noticed without proof as the basis of inference in ascertaining some other matter of fact. And we have a couple of more here to finish this off from a source of Wigmore on evidence. Evidence represents any knowledgeable fact or group of facts, not legal or a logical principle, considered with the view of its being offered before a legal tribunal for the purpose of producing persuasion, positive or negative, on the part of the tribunal as to the truth of a proposition, not of law or of logic, on which the determination of the tribunal is to be asked. And then the last one we'll look at here comes from a California Evidence Code. And from this source, evidence is described as testimony, writings, material objects, or other things presented to the senses that are offered to prove the existence or non-existence of a fact. So we've heard several statements and definitions of evidence that the courts and legal authorities might use, and they may not be that particularly useful for the surveyor and particularly from the standpoint of looking for boundary evidence. And the authors admit this, and to kind of wrap this up, they go on after all of these are stated here and say that most of these definitions were written for attorneys in the courts, and these definitions lend themselves to the lawyers and the courts' definitions. However, to summarize the bulleted definition, the surveyor should consider evidence as follows. And they describe that as, any document, object, writing, action, thing, verbal statement, or other information that is identified to prove the fact that is in question. They go on to say it is evidence that perpetuates the location of corners and boundaries. 
Seldom does the investigator and the person who makes the subsequent evaluation of the evidence have clear facts. The older the boundary, the less clear it may be. Its evidence is of prime importance in finding its precise location. Whatever remaining evidence there is must be interpreted to determine what was established at some point in the past. The next section, section 2-2, goes over the surveyor's role in evidence. And here the textbook says that a surveyor is intimately involved with evidence from the creation of the original survey to its subsequent recovery by a retracing surveyor. The span of time between the two may be a few days or many decades or possibly a century or more. Many things can happen from the time a surveyor creates the initial evidence until a retracing surveyor acting as a witness is asked to recover it, interpret it, and explain it to a client, an attorney, or to a court of law. What you see on this slide is figure 2-1 that's uh, in, this, in this chapter. And you might be able to read this from the slide. If not, look at the full page view of this in your textbook here within this chapter. Or you can view it in the PDF handout that lists the slides at one slide per page. And what this is, is an attempt by the authors to give the readers insight and to provide an opinion as to what we see as the role of the surveyor in the area of evidence. And you've got a flow chart here that goes from the beginning of the survey to the end of the survey. You've got really two pieces of information here. You've got the flow chart itself that goes from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 and then to 7. And underneath that, the various parts are defined. So if we look at the first part from the beginning of the survey on, and this would take care of um, items 1 and 2, we're gathering evidence. And you can see we obtain a base deed description, obtain parole evidence, uh, we've got abstract base deed, we measure, we calculate, and so on. And then when we get out of that phase, we go from what's marked as 3 to about 0.5. And that's analyzing evidence and decide questions of law and questions of fact and resolve conflicts or conflicts that are not resolved. And here we're assembling and analyzing evidence. We're reaching conclusions. If there's no conflicts, if we discover conflicts, we uh, prepare a preliminary report, let people know about that, arbitrate the conflicts, any legal action that might be necessary by the client, and then conflicts are not resolved, we prepare a final report and go to the end. And then the last part there is described as perpetuating the determined locations, segregate remaining conflicts, and prepare final report. And here we're setting new evidence, we're preparing the final report, we're preparing a plat, and we're writing a description. So that's one way of looking at the timeline, if you will, in a flowchart form of activities that take place in a survey with the different types of evidence and uses of evidence interjected with it. We'll move over now to section 2-3 which goes over the scope of the rest of the chapter and what they start out with here is called the laws of evidence and we want to read through this to get an idea of as we go through the rest of this lecture and look at the various legal principles that are spelled out what they're based on and what they're pointing to. It says there that the laws of evidence not only include the definition of evidence, but must, of necessity, also include the effect of evidence and the competency of a surveyor to do the following. Recognize what is evidence, evaluate the evidence found, and then make a conclusion or conclusions from the found evidence to prove the points in question. So now we'll go ahead and go through the sections that contain legal principles that build on the laws of evidence. Now we get into the topic of the importance and necessity of being impartial and this is section 2-4 in the chapter and first we'll go over the first two principles that are listed in this section. Principle 1 states that a surveyor should learn and understand the basic rules of evidence for his or her state as well as the federal rules of evidence. The text says that whenever one practices a profession, the individual should be knowledgeable about and understand the, quote, rules of engagement. For the retracing surveyor, the basic is evidence. Since the surveyor creates the original evidence, then describes this created evidence in field notes or descriptions, uh, 
and then many years later expects some other surveyor to identify and recover this ancient evidence, both the creating surveyor and the retracing surveyor should have an understanding of what is expected of each. Then we get to the second principle that says that a surveyor should strive equally as hard to prove not only the position he or she is trying to prove, but also the opposing view. Impartiality is a key factor and an absolute for a professional surveying expert. Until the mid-1950s, there were no guidelines as to the uses and presentations of evidence to and in the courts. Congress initiated a study for the federal courts and the resultant document was the Federal Rules of Evidence that became applicable to all federal courts. And it goes on to talk a little bit more about how those fit into the process after the mid-1950s. It should be obvious to you that as a professional land surveyor, and the key word is professional, is that you're, one of the charges that you have is for the welfare of the general public, and impartiality becomes very important. And as professionals, we have to make sure that we prove or disprove all evidence equally. If you read through the rest of that section, it gives some pretty strong words about basically saying that the surveyor can't be biased. We have to be in an unbiased position and we have to, from a very professional attitude and very professional stature, we have to make sure that we work with the evidence in a way that truly shows where the line was laid on the ground by the original surveyor and not show any favoritism towards either one of the landowners. And as the textbook states, professional surveyors should maintain an impartial position in any boundary issue. Staying with the same topic, we have principles three and four. And principle three says that an expert surveyor's opinion is predicated on the evidence that is considered at the time the opinion is formulated. Change the evidence and the opinion may also change. The text goes on to say that a surveyor's opinion is based on the evidence that was originally created, then described, and subsequently recovered and evaluated. Since evidence is a major factor in helping the surveyor to formulate the opinion, if and when the evidence is ever altered by adding to or subtracting from, then the expert's opinion may also be affected. Surveyors should be very careful in making premature opinions based on partial, incomplete, or faulty evidence before sufficient evidence is recovered and then evaluated. And then in Principle 4, it says that the surveyor should never use the adjective all in describing evidence. Expert opinions are based on available evidence. There may be other evidence about which the surveyor was unaware or was withheld from him or her. When dealing with historic evidence, including documents and field information, or a multitude or complexity of evidence, there can be no absolute certainty that research and field recovery have uncovered all the evidence. To write the word all, or state at trial that I considered all the evidence, could make for an embarrassing situation when a document is found that was never examined or was overlooked while doing research or the opposing expert surveyor produced evidence that conflicted with your evidence. That's just one example of words that we have to be careful that we use as professional surveyors. We have to think about what we're saying and realize that when we use a word like this at all in this situation, we're basically implying a guarantee that we had all the evidence and no other evidence exists. So something to think about when you're choosing words to describe what you've produced. And then we get to principle five, which is still under the heading of importance and necessity of being impartial. And this principle says that every survey of a conveyance must start from evidence that proves the position of at least two consecutive monuments somehow related to the written record. The text goes on to say that an indispensable part of every survey that either creates the parcel or lines of the parcel and the subsequent retracement of the existing conveyance is the discovery and the evaluation of the original evidence. And then it makes a very important statement here that says that evidence is not proof. The text goes on to say that evidence is the commencement of the recovery process from which one must make conclusions and from these conclusions flows the proof. Proof is the establishment of the sufficient requisite evidence to instill in the mind 
of the trier of fact or the surveyor as to the facts at issue. It is the totality of all of the evidence that persuades the trier of fact, which would be the surveyor or the jury, as to the truth of the location of the parcel being retraced. There's a couple of example statements that the textbook uses here to show the difference between a question based on evidence and a statement based on proof. It says that consider the question, is this an original corner? Does the recovered evidence as it relates to the documented evidence that describes that particular corner or parcel correlate to the found evidence on the ground? If so, then the evidence creates the following in the mind of the surveyor. Quote, I have found the original point of the corner. The found evidence proves the original corner location. So you can kind of see there the difference between how you treat something as evidence versus how you treat the result of the evaluation of the evidence as proof. At this point in the text, the authors have put together steps in performing a survey of a parcel of land. They preface this list here by saying in the process of performing a complete survey of any parcel of land, whether it is considered an original survey or a retracement, certain steps should be followed usually in this order. Number one, a request, preferably in writing, for the survey is obtained usually from the client or preferably from the title company. Two, title evidence is researched and obtained either by an attorney or a surveyor. Usually this is written evidence of title in the form of deeds, abstracts, title policy, or plat. Number three, the surveyor should rely on documents and information delivered by the client only in rare instances. Four, evidence of maps, field notes, county and city records of surveys, state and other public agency records of surveys, and necessary written records that disclose evidence of monument positions, both pro and con, pertaining to the survey is obtained. Five, adjoiner deeds for evidence of seniority or conflicts are examined or read. And six, armed with evidence of existing monuments called for in the writings and witnessing evidence of possession and usage, the parcel is inspected. Item seven, testimony or evidence of the existence and location of old monuments and the history of possession is sought and evaluated. Eight, measurements are made from found monuments to determine search areas or locations to dig for missing monuments and measurements, also evidence, to tie found monuments together are made. Nine, calculations, which is also a form of evidence, are made to confirm found monuments or to determine the validity of areas or the marking of lost corners. 10. From the evidence of monuments, measurements, testimony, and computations, conclusions in accordance with the laws of evidence are made. 11. Based on these conclusions, measurements are made to set new monuments in accordance with these conclusions. And 12. Finally, a report should be prepared for the client. And the report then becomes new evidence. And you should go ahead and read the remaining couple of paragraphs there that follow this list in your textbook to be able to grasp everything that is, was explained in this very important and lengthy section. Section 2.5 in the text talks about how the subject matter is going to be arranged as you go through the rest of the chapter. You can read that to see why the flow of information is going to be given in the, in the order that it is. And we could go ahead then in the lecture here and, and jump to section 2-6 which describes five different kinds of evidence. They said that in section 2-1 evidence was defined and identified by various legal scholars. You remember we looked at that uh, several slides back. Courts and legal scholars recognize at least five kinds of evidence which the surveyor should become familiar with. Number one says written evidence is evidence in the form of documents. Two is real evidence consisting of material objects addressed directly to the senses, and this includes physical monuments. Three is oral evidence or testimony, is evidence given by witnesses. Four is judicial notice, is evidence, and the form of knowledge. The courts may take judicial notice of certain facts, such as A, the true significance and meaning of all English words and phrases,
B, whatever is established by law, C, the laws of nature, and D, other well-known and commonly accepted facts. And five is circumstantial evidence may be the most important of all the forms or types of evidence when it relates to ancient boundaries. Moving on into section 2-7, we have a title here of Evidence, Conclusions, and Proof. And principle 6 says that evidence is not proof, evidence leads to proof, a consideration of sufficient evidence and conclusions to be drawn from evidence in accordance with the law of evidence may produce proof. We've kind of said that in a past section here, but they're expanding on this somewhat. And you should go ahead and read the remaining portions of that section to see how that principle is justified. Now we're going to get into section 2.8, and this is a very important topic here, the classifications of evidence. There's ten different classifications here, and you've probably heard these terms before, but it's very important that you understand how they differ from one another. And as we read through this, you know, out of the textbook, you'll see that they're giving, in most cases, some examples and most of them are related to surveying as to examples of each of these different classifications of evidence. And you have to make sure you understand that there's kinds of evidence and classifications of evidence and then types of evidence. And so we have to make sure that we can differentiate between these as we go through the rest of this material. They say evidence varies in weight and dignity and in general evidence may be divided into ten classifications. The first is indispensable evidence, and this is evidence that is necessary to prove a fact. The example they give here is conveyance of property must be in writing, hence a conveyance cannot be proved without proof that there was a written document. The second is conclusive evidence, and this is that which the law does not permit to be contradicted. The example is the contents of conveyance writings recital of a consideration excluded are conclusive as between the parties except for pleadings of illegality, fraud, mistake, or reformation. Also, the written document or contract cannot be altered by oral testimony and as is commonly and frequently stated, everyone is presumed to know the law. The third is prima facie evidence, and this is that which suffices for proof of a fact until rebutted by other evidence. In the event that an original deed cannot be produced, a recorded deed is prima facie evidence of the contents of the original. In many areas, the results of the survey of certain official surveyors, such as the county surveyor, are prima facie evidence of the location of lines. Prima facie evidence may be disproved, but until it has been proved incorrect, it is assumed to be correct. The law specifies what is and is not prima facie evidence. And that example of the county surveyor is very important because we use the records of the county surveyor's office for section corner location in many states, including Indiana. Since the county surveyor is an official title, if the evidence for, based on the corner card or whatever shows a particular monument tied down and witnessed as being the section corner or the quarter corner that would stand as prima facie evidence and that would only can only be disproved by other evidence so that'll be held true unless it's disproved four is primary evidence and that is uh, described as that which is most certain the contents of a written document are more certain than the oral testimony of what the document contained. Five is secondary evidence, which is inferior to primary evidence. A copy of the original document is inferior to the original. Secondary evidence is used to prove the content of lost or unavailable primary evidence. Then we get to number six, which is direct evidence, and this proves a fact directly without resorting to presumptions or inference. For example, a witness testifies, I saw the surveyor drive the stake into the ground. That would be direct evidence. Seven, circumstantial or indirect evidence depends on inferences or presumptions that tend to prove a fact by proving another. For example, a witness testifies, quote, I saw the surveyor drive similar stakes at other corners. You can see the difference there between direct and circumstantial or indirect evidence. 
8 is partial evidence, and this establishes some detached fact. At times, it is erroneously referred to as corroborative evidence. 9 is extrinsic evidence. We've talked about this in other courses, and this is derived from sources outside the writings. And then 10, corroborative evidence is supplementary to evidence already given and tending to strengthen or confirm evidence already given. It is additional evidence of a different character. Corroborative evidence, if used, may also act in a negative aspect. So those are your classifications of evidence. Now we move on to the types of evidence gathered by and considered by surveyors. And this is section 2-9 and it says there that evidence used by surveyors to prove boundary lines or deed line locations can be placed in the following categories. Before any evidence can be used or considered, it first must be tied to written document or documents in the chain of title. These can be any of the following six categories. Number one is written documents, maps, and historical facts directly traceable to the specific parcel. Two would be facts, laws, and documents of which the court may take judicial notice. Three would be physical objects, which is real evidence, observed by the surveyor, for example, surveyor stakes, trees, fences, rivers, and street improvements. Four is parole evidence, which may be divided into A, witnesses who observe the former location of physical objects, which might be a monument that had been destroyed. B, witnesses who can explain a latent ambiguity. And we learned about latent and patent ambiguities in our surveying law course. C, witnesses who can testify about commonly reported facts and D, witnesses who can describe the customs or conditions existing as of the date of the deed. Five is measurements of distances, bearings, and angles that were conducted, and six is mathematical calculations including correlations and algorithms. We'll move now into section 2-11 which is entitled the law of evidence and we've got here a definition and that definition says that the law of evidence is a collection of general rules established either by statute law or by case law to accomplish the following. Number one, declare what is to be taken as true without proof. Two, declare the presumptions of law and identify those that may be rebuttable and those that may be irrebuttable as well as that may define as both those that are disputable and those that are conclusive. Three is to produce legal evidence, four to exclude whatever is not legal, and five to determine in certain cases the value and the effect of evidence. To start to explain this, we'll go through part of what follows. It says there that the surveyor is involved in evidence in two instances. We keep coming back to this original surveyor and retracement surveyor. First, as the individual who creates the original evidence of the original boundary or boundaries, and second as the individual who is given the task or responsibility of recovering the evidence of the first surveyor. The success of the second surveyor is directly affected by the quality of the evidence returned by the first. Obviously if the original surveyor doesn't leave much to follow then the retracement surveyor isn't going to have very good success in finding original evidence. They go on to say that the two surveyors, the creating surveyor and the retracing surveyor, are seldom the same individual and in many instances decades or centuries may separate the work of these two individuals. You can go on and read the rest of that so that you get a good understanding of the law of evidence. Over the next several slides we're going to go through some common legal statements and terms that you've probably heard of them. Make sure that we understand what all this means. Section 212 starts with burden of proof. The term burden of proof does not have a fixed and definite meaning and application. On the contrary, at times it is used indiscriminately to signify one or both of two distinct ideas or philosophies. There has been a concentrated effort to bring a clear and uniform understanding of its meaning. In recent decisions, courts have held that the burden of proof signifies the duty or obligation of establishing a conviction in the minds of the jury or the judge of the ultimate 
issue or question being tried. The interpretation of what the term burden of proof means has one meaning at law, but may have multiple meanings when applied by the various judges. To the surveyor, it should have only one meaning. In legal circles, the term is defined as follows, and it comes from the Latin onus probandi, and it says, in the law of evidence, the necessity or duty of affirmatively proving a fact or facts in dispute on an issue raised between the parties in a cause. Later in the section it states that the law points out two burdens. One, the burden to produce enough evidence so that a reasonable conclusion can be reached. And two, the burden of persuasion or producing evidence so that the preponderance of the evidence will be in favor of the individual who raises the question. And that takes us to principle seven, which says that the affirmative party or plaintiff in a civil case has the duty of presenting sufficient evidence to convince either the judge or jury of the allegations. He or she has the burden of proof. A defendant has no obligation to present evidence. And then the text after the principle says that the burden of proof or the need to prove the case lies with the party who wishes to prove the fact. The individual wishing to prove his or her title has that burden and cannot rely on the weakness of the other person's title. The surveyor seeking to prove a survey is correct cannot rely on the fact that the other party had no survey. However, this burden can shift under certain circumstances. The individual who seeks an affirmative defense or who seeks a counterclaim has the burden shifted. We'll jump now to section 2-14 and talk about preponderance of evidence. It starts off with principle 8. In civil cases that deal with boundary issues, it is not necessary to prove, quote, beyond a reasonable doubt, as in criminal cases, it is only necessary to prove a, quote, preponderance of evidence. And they go on to say that preponderance of evidence is the least demanding of the three categories, or according to some courts, more credible and convincing. Preponderance of the evidence is not considered by the number of the witnesses, but by the ability of one or more witnesses to convince the jury or the judge, and perhaps the opposing party. It is the greater weight of the evidence, not the total weight or totality of the witnesses. The surveyor cannot always prove conclusively, quote, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that found monuments are positively in their correct position, or if they even are the original monuments. If they are to be upheld by the courts, the surveyor must be prepared to prove that the preponderance of evidence is in his or her favor. A second surveyor in disagreement with the first must be prepared to prove by a preponderance of evidence that the other is wrong. This preponderance criterion is the threshold from which all evidence is related. From this evidence base, the decision is the evidence to prove the facts, then it is sufficient. The more conclusive the evidence, the more certain are the facts. So what's important out of here is the statement that says that in the case of boundary issues we do not need to prove the beyond a reasonable doubt concept but rather the preponderance of evidence. Next we have section 2-15 clear and convincing. Principle 9 says that a person claiming adverse possession, acquiescence, or loss of property rights must usually present clear and convincing evidence goes on to say that modern courts require proof of property rights by unwritten means to be quote clear and convincing or quote clear and positive or quote clear and satisfactory or in some other way quote clear. And then we have in section 2-16 beyond a reasonable doubt. The text says that beyond a reasonable doubt is the proof usually required to prove guilt in criminal cases. Yet this degree of evidence is also the degree of proof that is required by the Bureau of Land Management in differentiating between a lost and obliterated corner. Reasonable doubt is a term well understood by the courts but very difficult to define by the surveyor. The difficulty is that each surveyor will apply a different standard to the terminology. What is reasonable to one surveyor may not be reasonable to another. And then we have principle 10 that says a survey may be proved by any evidence of facts 
that are relevant and material, but this evidence may not be admissible. Next we have relevancy and materiality, and we have two different sections here. Section 2-17 deals with these two topics as stated, and then Section 218 is entitled Admissibility, Relevancy, and Conclusiveness of Evidence. On this slide I'm just going to go over how they define both relevancy and materiality, and then we'll go over Principle 11. Relevancy is a relationship between the evidence being used and the fact, theory, or proposition that the surveyor wishes to prove. Materiality addresses the question of whether the evidence that is offered relates to the question or issue that is to be proved. And after that statement on materiality in our text, they give an example that shows the difference between the two. They say, if section corners of section 10 are in question, all section corners in that section are relevant, but the corners of the other sections are not material if all the section corners of section 10 are recovered and proven. So if you understand the public land system and retracement and how you work with corners that are presumed to be lost, that example should make some sense to you. They then conclude this with principle 11 that says that a surveyor is concerned about the relevancy of the evidence and not the admissibility of the evidence. Some of the other topics and terms that are discussed in some of the sections that follow here are admissibility, presumptions, inferences, and extrinsic evidence. And many of these terms we've covered in previous courses, particularly the survey law course. I just wanted to go over some of these and mention again other terms that you're going to have to refresh your memory on relative to their definition. Admissibility is a legal question involving whether the court will permit relevant evidence to be admitted so as to be heard and considered by the jury. The basic rule is, quote, except as otherwise provided, all relevant evidence is admissible. Presumptions, that's a term we worked with in the survey law course. Presumptions of law are deductions that the law expressly directs to be concluded from certain known facts, and presumptions are either conclusive or rebuttable. We also learned about what an inference was. An inference is evidence in the form of a logical conclusion from a set of facts without express direction of the law to that effect. And we've talked about extrinsic evidence as far back as the legal descriptions course. And extrinsic evidence is evidence outside of the writings, sometimes referred to as external evidence. And again, we've got patent ambiguity and latent ambiguity, different types of ambiguities that you might find in deeds and other documents. And we need to know the difference between those two. The last section in the chapter is 2-27, and it's the duties of surveyors in finding evidence. And I suggest you read that entire section over. We're just going to cover the principle that's in there, which is principle 13, and then the closing paragraph. Principle 13 says that surveyors are presumed to know the laws of evidence pertaining to a location of land boundaries described by writings, and they are charged with the responsibility of knowing how to apply the laws of evidence when they locate deed boundaries. And then the text that follows that principle says that it is the responsibility of the surveyor to obtain all sufficient and credible evidence and then make a correct boundary line determination or location in accordance with controlling writings. Failure to find all the necessary evidence to make a correct location is not an excuse for an incorrect survey. The surveyor should correctly locate the written title lines and also report unwritten title rights while recovering, interpreting, and reporting this evidence. And the way I interpret that and the way I've always interpreted what we're talking about here as far as the duties of a surveyor in finding evidence is that there really is no excuse for a surveyor to not look for enough evidence. The courts are going to presume that uh, if you're in front of the judge and jury that you have done everything you can possibly do to look for evidence. I often hear 
surveyors talking when we're going through courses or seminars and just how much evidence is enough just how much research do I have to do and I think that this statement here and the principle that preceded this say very well how much you need to do you need to go to the highest degree of effort to be able to uncover the evidence that's out there so that concludes this rather lengthy lecture we have covered a lot of material here but it's necessary material to get into early in this course so that we can start looking at different types of evidence and explaining the different um, types of evidence that surveyors work with. So what we've covered here included the surveyor's role in boundary determination. We revisited and talked throughout the lecture about original surveys versus retracement surveys. Learned something about the definition and definitions of evidence, the surveyor's role in evidence, the law of evidence. We learned about being impartial we talked about evidence versus proof and what the difference is. Went through some steps for performing a boundary survey. We looked at evidence, conclusions, and proof. We got into the kinds of evidence. We got into the classifications of evidence. We got into the types of evidence gathered by surveyors. And then we got into burden of proof, preponderance of evidence, clear and convincing, beyond a reasonable doubt, relevancy and materiality. We talked a little bit about admissibility and refreshed ourselves with some definitions of some terms we learned in past classes. And then we talked about the duties of the surveyors in finding evidence. So as will be the usual case, unless otherwise stated, there is a lecture quiz which is available for you, that you on the course management system that you would be able to, uh, should be able to take now. These quizzes are closed book closed note and as much as we talked about proctors needed for exams I, it would be unreasonable for me to have you go to a proctor every time there was a quiz here so you are on your honor these courses are purposely done in a closed book closed note fashion because that's the way that you'll be required to take the professional examinations and so that's why we do it that way so that's available for you and there's a timestamp on there relative to when that has to be done by and remember that late submissions are not accepted and there's an assignment for you out there that would be relevant to the lecture and the material that we went over so you'll be hearing from me very soon with our next lecture